So it's International Women's Day, and I want to acknowledge grandmothers, mothers, aunties, sisters, neighbors, school teachers. It's important to realize that resiliency is about mastery. It's a lifelong process, and just because you're good at it today, top of the game, maybe in your career, your personal life, your neighborhood, you're the go-to guy or gal. Well, in 20 years from now, maybe. And then I had to fire my therapist at the hospital because he came in one day and said, you know, you're just too happy. I'm an expert. I've got a degree in psychology and a degree in theology, and you're too happy. You're going to die, so you got to get serious. And then I got serious about fighting for my life, and so I went back in, and I was really blessed. I had a Dr. George P. Connick for, on my medical team who said things like, so Michael, if you think it's all about me and these hands operating on you, you're confused. It's nothing to do with these hands except for a lot of training because, you see, he said, we've got to give you, and you've got to give you, a chance to fight the fight. So he pointed at my head and said, you've got to start it. He pointed at my heart and said, you've got to lead it. And then he put his hands together and he said, you've got to build the prayer team because I don't know why or how, but it's way out of my hands because if I thought your cure had anything to do with just these hands, I couldn't fit my ego through the door. So he luckily gave me another chance to re-examine how I was going to fight for my life. So we've heard a lot about happiness and joy and don't let what happens to you define you. And I would ask when you leave here in the days ahead, how do you let what happens define you? Who do you let in your life define you? So in giving yourself a chance, whether it's a second chance or a third chance or a fourth chance in my case, who do you invite on your team? Because I like to speak to people about being resilient, and part of being resilient is building a team of support, respect, love, dignity, but also a few people now and again that will look in the ear, literally or intellectually grab you by the ear and say, no, not that way, this way. So who do you invite on your team to tell you the truth as they see it? And to get those 400 plus get well cards in the first three weeks, and some of them, well, to this day I get weak in the knees talking about it. My mother's friend, She's got, she phoned around from Toronto down to Halifax and she found a florist in February who had a straw hat, who put a crocus in the hat and sent garden gloves. Because when you get better this summer, you're going to plant the crocus with those gloves. So, who do you allow to give you a push or a poke when you need it? Like our smile guru, I like a personal challenge that I can take time to work on. And so for the first six months to two years, she was a nasty old, pick a word. <laughs> Veterinarians might use it frequently. <laughs> I'd say hello and good morning, and she would just frown at me as to how dare I be having a nice day because she was living in hell. But, hey, I'd survived a couple of rounds, three rounds of cancer, so what's a little bad attitude? One day I finally said to her, it's a great day outside, why don't you come out and sit on the outside bench? What's so great about it? I said, we're both alive and we're neighbors. And you look radiant in the blue jacket. <laughs> so, whether you think you can or think you can, it's up to you. And how we choose to frame or reframe our incidents in life, they can be nasty and ugly and hurt us. But whether it's divorce, or financial hardships, or health issues, employment, the list is long. But the result is we can still choose to frame and reframe, surround ourselves with people that are respectfully upbeat to make a difference. Because let me leave you with a poem that I really think speaks to the essence of what it takes to be resilient. It goes like this. It's the human touch in this world that counts. It's the touch of your hand and mind. It means far more to a beating heart than shelter, bread, or wine. Because shelter's over when the day is done, and bread lasts but a day. But the sound of your voice and the touch of your hand will last long in the soul always. I've asked him to come up here to talk about energy. Michael Ballard! So a long time ago, an expert told me I was too happy. And I said, well, why is that? Well, you've got cancer and spread and you're going to die soon. And I said, well, no, I might die, but so are you. We're just not sure which month, which year. And so it turns out that because I was so happy, he thought that meant I didn't understand that I was really ill. 
So I'd like to talk to you about your energy. Energy yes. management. Mellow's a nice state to be in when you're in a crisis or anybody ever feel overwhelmed about paperwork? Or emails? Or Twitter accounts that the boss says you have to manage? So, or I would like you to consider that partly our energy is a choice. Oh yes, it's dependent in part on our personality styles. And yes, it's dependent in part on our exercise regime. And yes, it's partly designed on our diet. But then there's the choices we make that we're not always conscious we're making. So being mindful that you have a neighbor beside you within a few inches. I don't want a letter from your lawyer saying, and then they got an elbow in the eye and caused. I want you to do what I do when I work with six-year-olds that have had lots of issues with energy. Some of them have been brought up in, in stressful situations, so they end up in foster care. Some of them run into me because was one, one young man said, I have Tourette's and I say things. And he sure did. <laughs> and you know how we're all as adults allegedly have a filter? He didn't have a filter and I saw him in action. Wow, he said out loud what a lot of us think and the poor kid was always embarrassed. So we taught him some basic skills on how to manage his energy and he was all excited because his grandma wants him to learn how to manage it to a point and maybe some medication as opposed to another family member thought that drugs was the answer. Well, maybe for some of us when we were 19, drugs were the answer. But it's not a lifestyle a nine-year-old wants to have. He was a pretty smart little boy. So I want you to, watching out for your neighbor, try a silly but serious exercise. We had him put his thumb in the pit. You're now about to practice the slow chicken. This is a one-armed chicken exercise. And as you inhale, belly out and down, Okay, now, if you have cardiac, breathing. Michael, and I wanted to talk to you about resiliency, and I got very interested in resiliency because a long time ago, a medical expert with good intentions told me there was nothing I could do with my chronic illness. Now, I wasn't looking for a cure because at, at a cellular level, you got what you got, but what the medical expert with good intentions didn't know was Harvard Medical School, way back in time, had already had seven.